Okay, hi, I'm Bob Smith, and um, I'm one of the mentors in residence here, and I'll be giving the, uh, the pitch on how to pitch, when you have to pitch, and only the right pitch will do. Um, as a means of background, I normally have a this is me slide. Um, I am uh, what you call a serial entrepreneur, I guess. I didn't know there was such a thing. When I went to GW here, you didn't even call yourself an entrepreneur. You basically said you started businesses. Um, and then all of a sudden it became hip to be an entrepreneur. So then everybody's like, yeah, man, I'm an entrepreneur. And as you can see, I'm wearing my official entrepreneur outfit. <laughs> you know you're an entrepreneur when you're a middle-aged guy in a pair of jeans and a white shirt and a sport coat, because that means that I get it. Um, I have uh, been part of uh, a, an active part of either as a CEO, senior member, or, or strategist for uh, 14 or 15 startups, I've had seven exits. I've raised over $100 million in venture capital. I have, uh, including from my own venture capital fund, uh, I've also started two seed funds uh, in the Northern Virginia area. So I've done a lot of pitching, uh, including a public road show, which is the ultimate in pitching, when you've got like 20 minutes to tell them everything about your company and they're trying to throw you up before you get there. And all you want to do is get back to the limo because there's free drinks in it. We mentioned the free drinks. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to teach you uh, what uh, the Bob guide to, uh, to how to pitch your company. So we'll start off with a little audio visual here. I decided to do my presentation in a handwritten form because I thought it would be like a really pleasant break from all the like harsh black and white PowerPoint we've been sitting through. My name is Rachel Sequoia, as you heard, like the tree, although that's not actually a sequoia. Um, I love a lot of things. I would say I'm a lover, not a fighter, uh, if I had to make an old cliche. But um, I'm here today to talk to you guys about air. Air is, you know, roughly like 70 to 79 percent nitrogen, 20 to 25 percent oxygen, uh, depending on who you ask, and like 1 percent like other stuff. I'm not quite sure what that is, like methane or something, I don't know, but like other stuff. But my theory is that air is like at least 6 percent energy, you know, because um, there's like all these people in it all the time, and we're like breathing and interacting, and we're like you know, like putting our energy and our like life force into this air. So I think that pollution is not only like smoke and smog, but it's also bad and negative energy and stuff. You know, I feel like that's like really unhealthy. Clean air promotes good health and it's good for you and it's good for the world. Um, now I'm going to take you guys off for a second. Let's talk about travel. Travel um, broadens your perspective. It can help you get to know the earth, you know, and help remind you that we all live on the same planet and remind you, you know, that there's there's other people and there's mysteries to still be explored. There's always great food, great smells. And I think that's something that's all encompassing of these factors is the air. Because, you know, if you can like, you know, smell good okay, smells. Okay, well, I will keep going there, but quick show of hands. Do you think this is the right way to pitch a company? Who thinks it's the right way? Good, because that is not the right way to pitch a company. That was actually a spoof that was done in Silicon Valley. That was a live thing. They just brought this woman in, and later on, they pull back, and she's barefoot. And she's just going on and on. It just gets more absurd, and they keep cutting to the crowd, and all these VCs are looking at each other like, what the heck? I think I've sat in that. I, I, think, I, you know, I think I've been in that. I may have given this at one point, but I, I don't know. But it's not. It's just nonsense. I mean, she drew it on a on a piece of you know pa paper, just like what it's going to be. So, yeah, that it's about air. It, it winds up being about a travel thing that is nonsense, and it's just crazy. But I always thought that was funny. She's one of my favorites that uh, I get to see. So we don't want to be her, right? So <laughs> I, I may be this guy right at this point, <laughs> but the key is don't be this guy either. You, you don't want to be nonsensical. You also don't want to put people to sleep. So, what is your investor pitch? It's really the story about your business, and people forget this quite often. The first thing they think about is, it's the story of my technology. And just keep in mind that that's not what it is. It's the story of your business. You have about a minute's worth of time when you sit down in front, in front of somebody like me for me not to get bored. And you will know when somebody like me is bored, because they start rifling through the deck, right? They start looking at their watch. They're playing with, their, with whatever they got, their gizmo. So you got to make your point quickly. You got to tell them an interesting story, right? So, what makes a story good? We got to have engaging characters, right? You got to have something that people want to know. They got to be rooting for the hero here. 
You have to have a good plot. You can't put the people to sleep with a boring story that goes nowhere. You have to have exciting action. There's got to, there's got to move. And it's got to be at the point where the, where the you know, people want to see what the next thing coming up in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the movie is. And you want to have a climactic finish uh, with the audience rooting for the hero, right? At that point, the hero's you. So if you put that together, you got a pretty good story. You can have a, probably a pretty good pitch. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through how you do that and what, how that translates into a financial pitch. And I will tell you that most of you that are in the new venture competition will actually come and go through uh, me and a couple of other of the mentors, and we will be brutally critical of your, of your pitch. So pay attention to this, because a lot of this will come up in that uh, phase. So here is um, a, you know, if you think about a movie headline, right? And they, the movie, the, the advertisement for the movie comes on, and you know, you know, for, you know, they called him the man from somewhere. You know, the thing that gets you excited that makes you want a blockbuster. This is a blockbuster described, right? If if you can encapsulate your story into something like this, an investor's going to listen. And this is actually what uh, what Facebook had put out in their media kit. Um, now. That's the beginning of a story that somebody's going to want to hear and ultimately invest in. So the first thing to keep in, in mind is who your audience is. Your audience for this is somebody like me who has some money and doesn't want to give it away. Uh, because giving it away means they put it at risk. So they only want to make sure they really are in love with the idea before they put, it, uh, put their money down. So you want to make this person at the other end of the table um, uh, want to jump out of their seats and invest in you. So let's think about that person in the audience for a while. What's on the investor's mind? They don't care about your technology. They don't care about your solution. They don't care that you want to help the environment. They don't care about any of that. They want to know that if they put money in, they get money out. They're investors. Always keep that in mind, because we fall in love with our inventions. We fall in love with what we want to do. Many times, nowadays, we fall in love with what we aren't going to do. We fall in love with the ancillary benefits of what we're claiming to do. But really, an investor wants to know what you're going to do. Most, first and foremost, they want to know your business model. If you did nothing else in an investor pitch, if you said, it cost me a dollar to get somebody, and they spend $4 over their lifetime, and there's 5 million of those people, guess what? You get money. It's that simple. Right? This is a simple equation. Everybody misses that point. I've missed that point frequently. I've always known when I was dead, when I'm like five minutes into the presentation, and I never gave them a reason to care, because I was talking about what I wanted to talk about versus what they wanted to hear. Fear and greed is very important to an investor. Investors live off of fear and greed, and I'll get into that in a second. Managing risk is something that's really big uh, for them. Right? They're in the business of managing risk. They have to take it. They don't get high rewards without high risk. But at the same time, they live in fear of underperformance. And the final thing is exit arithmetic. It makes no difference for uh, an investor to put money into something if they don't get money out. So you'll find quite often somebody will come in and pitch you, and they'll just talk about how wonderful this thing is going to be and how great the technology is, and they're going to take 20% of the profits, and they're going to buy shoes for kids somewhere and all this. And you're like, well, how do I get my money out of this thing? Who do you sell to? And they go, I don't really don't know. I don't know that there's somebody who's going to buy this. OK, so I just put my money in a one-way trip to nowhere. They don't want to do that. By the way, I, I'm crediting my colleague Dan Gordon on these, because I just blatantly stole his slides for this. So uh, if you ever run into Dan Gordon, you say, oh, I heard your pitch. And he'll, he'll yell at me about that. But um, so the business model. They don't care about your product. I can't say this enough. You could give a successful pitch and never once mention your product. Funny as it sounds, you could. Um, in fact, you almost have a better pitch when they're asking you, well, what exactly is your product? I love what you're doing. What's your product? Um, investors, they really don't care much about the, um, the problem you solve for customers. And I disagree with him a little bit like this, because I think you ultimately have to get them to fall in love with your customer like you're in love with your customer. But they care about making money in, uh, by solving that problem, not the problem in itself, right? 
And investors care a lot about your business model. It's the one thing they care about is the business model. That math has to work. Your entire pitch is basically explaining a formula. Um, the last thing is the fear and greed. The fear is that I will lose my money. The greed is that if I don't invest, I won't make money. Always remember that. The bottom quote there, I think, is, one of the, is a really good illustration of it, that you know, the greed says, if I get $2.50 for each Google uh, Docs user, I'm going to make a bundle. The fear says, oh my gosh, Google will just take that over. Um, Anytime you pitch a VC, I can't tell you the number of times that I just wanted to just say, oh, for the love of God, Google's not coming after me. You go and you pitch something, well, well Google can just do that. Yes, Google can do a lot of stuff. That doesn't mean they're doing this. Well, Facebook will do that. Yeah, 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 Facebook, same deal. Facebook buys more companies than they put out of business. So don't let that slow you down. But that's the way their heads are working, right? I want to make all the money that I could on that, but then I fear that they'll just run me over and I won't have anything to do. So how do you construct a good pitch? You build a compelling story about your customer and your business model. This is all you're doing. If you can, again, do this and you win. So the first thing you want to have is an engaging character. I am a firm believer in the school of thought that says, if I can explain my customer and their problem to you in a very personal way, very human way, then you're going to want to listen about it. And I always take anybody that I work with through this exercise of telling me, tell me about the customer. Tell me about them, not just, you know, oh, my customer is uh, everybody with a right arm. Well, okay, well, that's a lot of people, but that doesn't really tell me much. Oh, well, it's, um, you know, families. Okay, well, again, I don't really know about that. And I don't know that you can really prove with, with a definition that broadly that you can actually, that you actually hit when your formula works. The more narrow I define that customer and the more personal their story is, I make that person, one, real, but two is I also create a scenario where it's pretty provable or not provable, right? Everybody get that? The tighter the focus on the customer, the better. If you could define a customer so precisely that that investor could walk up to that customer and say, do you have this problem? The customer goes, yes. Would you spend $20 to solve that problem? Yes. OK, boom, you're right. But the mushier you make it, the harder it is for the investor to, um, to actually understand if you're right, and the harder it is for you to know you're right. So we want to talk about this customer. Who is this person? What's their problem? Um, what, and, and, and why should we care? And that's one of the reasons why I think making them human is a real good point. Because if they're human, I understand the problem. So um, if I can, Justin, I want to use your example. Uh, we were just talking a little while ago. Justin has a, a software platform that uh, does math um, uh, uh, teaching for, uh, through a STEM-based uh, piece of content and makes it easy for teachers to grade. So if his first slide tells me, like, this is teacher X, this is how much time teacher X has to spend preparing a lesson plan, grading lessons, and then remediating for the students, right? Right now, I know that this is a person who's time constrained, doesn't have a lot of money, and could really use a lot of help. That person becomes real to me. So when you say you have a solution that's going to improve the, the speed, the time that that person grades, cut the time that person prepares for that lesson plan by half, right? And does it in such a way that that teacher doesn't have to go out and spend money on additional materials or that their school system has a, has a great way to serve a lot of different kids. Right away, I'm thinking, OK, well, maybe that'll work. Right? You want to be evocative about who the person is, right? So I would say, like, well, what, is, what, is, what do you think this story tells? Anybody? Tired. Tired? Good. What's another one? Frustrated? Good. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So instead of you talking for 20 minutes about a person, you can show a quick, easy picture and go, Getting customer service on a computer is hard, right? Or eye strain from a computer is a big problem, and it makes people fall asleep at the wheel. You can very quickly get people to understand that person and understand them in a very personal, human way. Same thing with this. Come on. It didn't work before. Now it's working too well. <laughs> um, same thing with this one, right? I mean, what about this person? What do we think about this person? Anybody on this side? Huh? She's having a good time, right? Fulfilled, maybe? So 
It doesn't have to necessarily be a problem. It could be people want to get away. Or, you know, imagine how good you, the, this person will feel when they don't have to worry about X. Or this person always hoped that their dreams would come true and their dreams came true. Pictures can really help tell that story and humanize it. I always think that that's a very important thing because I want to understand. And this doesn't mean that it all has to be, that's only for consumer. You could be somebody who's uh, doing actuarial software. And it can be the person in that, in that insurance office that's crunching numbers and you just made something easy for them. You can still talk about that person's life in a very human way. And the, always remember that you're always selling to humans. Your customer segments are humans. They're not buildings. They're not things. They're humans. So make people understand the human. Oh, come on. If you get investors rooting for your customer, maybe they'll start rooting for your business. That's the bottom line. So you got to have a good plot. What is the plot of an investor pitch? Well, it's really the business thesis. And if you can't write a very good, concise business thesis, you haven't gotten there yet. You haven't gotten to the point where, where your business model is honed, and you haven't gotten to a point where you should talk to an investor. And the first thing uh, that goes into it is we have customers. You want to have a problem statement. This customer has a problem that we solve. In your case, it was the amount of time it took a teacher to grade, um, uh, and that's a big problem, plus the fact that the teacher uh, didn't have an engaging way to get kids to study algebra. That's a problem. And by providing, which you introduce the solution, and then the value proposition. Now, an important thing to remember is value is not feature, are not features. Values are benefits. So if you say, um, my um, clicker has a button to go forward and backward, is that a feature or a benefit? What is the benefit of having that? Control. Control. And especially remote control, right? So I save time in walking. My presentation is more lifelike, although that's debatable. But theoretically, my presentation is more lifelike. And I can move around the stage more freely with my little wireless mic. So all of that works great. You need a unique selling position. There is no such thing as a unique product. There is no such thing that does not have competition. And in fact, the biggest, quickest way to fall on your sword is to say there's no competition or nobody's ever done anything like this. There is no such thing. So what you have to do in, in, in crafting your story is help them understand the problems with the current alternatives. Right? The current alternative to teacher grading, which we discussed outside, was that a, a teacher takes 15 hours on average right, to grade a homework assignment. Is that what you said? That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time for somebody that's not getting paid a whole lot and has to then prepare for the next lesson. So if you can cut that amount of time significantly, that's a huge benefit. So the current alternative is always great because it gives context to the, to the reviewer. And the bottom line is that this, it's got to have a payday at the end of the day. There's got to be a way to make money or they don't care, right? So they can't make money if you don't make money. So the first thing you have to illustrate to them is, by the way, we make money and how we do it. And if we make money, you make money. And that goes back to exit. It goes back to the size of the opportunity and other things that an investor is looking for. So I could stop now. And if you did a slide deck like this, and you did it succinctly, and you did it in a way that was easy to understand, you would know how to pitch an investor. And the best pitches that I've listened to over the years were usually not my own, but they were good. And, um, and usually they were people that did this effectively. But we'll dig a little deeper into some of these. So what's, what's that elevator, that product's elevator pitch? Huh? That's negative. Are you kidding? Nobody, well, maybe, maybe some products people buy if they're addictive. But what's, a, what's something that Coke would want to actually talk about? <laughs> like, Refreshing. What was Coke's old motto, old slogan when, when I was young? <laughs> you won't remember. You weren't alive. Um, it was Coke refreshes you best, right? That's an investor pitch right there almost. 
refreshes you best? Well, one, it refreshes, it refreshes me, and it does it best, right? So I've covered a number of the things that check off. But now, if I was really giving this pitch, I would say, I've got something that costs a penny to produce, and I can sell for a buck. People will drink one a day, and a billion people a day will drink it. Now you want to invest. It's just a bottle of Coke. But I put it in such a way that you understand the economics of it, you understand the appeal of it to a customer, and you understand the scale of the opportunity. That's how easy it, it, it can be when it's done right. Here's another one. This is Airbnb, their problem statement, which was price is an important concern. Hotels leave you disconnected from a city and no easy way to book a room with a local and become a, uh, or, or become a host. That was, that was their problem statement, right? And that really accurately de defines them. It talks to the, their, how they are relative to the current solutions. It talks about um, the fact that they're a value provider. And it talks about the fact that they're a, 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 business, a, a marketplace business that serves both buyers and sellers. So it's very succinct and very helpful for an investor to understand. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're up on the... So when an investor sees a line like that second one, hotels leave you disconnected, it's, it's not, it seems like a very qualitative claim. Um, so how do you know that would an investor have to point that out and say, prove that? Um, they, they, yes. The truth of the matter is, and what, what that does pretty well is, uh, and that goes to something more about their brand attitude and, the, and what, they're, what they're aspiring, their brand aspiration is that they connect you to the city. But an investor would probably come back and go, we'll prove it. And then you can say, look, we did 120 interviews of people. And what they didn't like about hotels were they, were, they felt isolated. So a benefit doesn't have to be completely numeric, completely um, uh, rational. Emotional benefits are many times much more powerful. And so you can use this, but yes, you should be prepared to back it up. Um, so I call this a true story. Your problem should be tangible, relevant, urgent, and easily stated. High concept problems make your investor that's listening, makes the audience listening to it, wonder where you're going. If, if they can't get right away how you're stating the problem, then what they do is they, they go off into tangents about, one, trying to figure out what you're talking about, and then two, trying to figure out if that was right. Right? But the more tangible and relevant you make it, you know, you're thirsty, you need a Coke. You want to change slides from across the room, you get a clicker. Things that people can really understand very quick and urgent, right? Remember, the more urgent, the more pressing a problem, the more people will be likely pay, the more value they receive from a quick um, solution. Now, you've heard some during some of the talks probably or some of the things we've had you watch, the hair on fire problem. Do you guys remember that? Okay, so I'll tell you the, the hair on fire problem and uh, how, who remembers Michael Jackson? Oh, everybody, right? I mean, it's Michael Jackson, right? It's King of Pop. Okay, so you may not remember that Michael Jackson was in a Pepsi commercial years ago. And it was this big production number and Michael's up there and he's you know, singing and they were gonna fire all these fireworks off and Michael was gonna sing and he was gonna step down stage. Well, they fire off the fireworks and Michael's hair literally catches on fire. So, what I like to say to people, now at that point, was Michael really discerning about how his hair went out? No, his hair was literally on fire. He wants that solution now. There was urgency. He would have paid any amount of money to get his hair to stop being on fire. So it just goes to illustrate that if, if the problem isn't a big problem, nobody will pay a lot of money for it. If there's a lot of other alternatives that might be cheaper or easier to get to, they won't do it. I'll give you another illustration. One of the things that, that came through, and I, I don't even know where this came through now. It might have come through my work in Virginia. It might have come through um, some of the stuff we're doing at i -Corps. But somebody developed a way to measure the depths of tire gauges as trucks go through way stations, right? Sounds like a good idea. Big, uh, nice piece of technology can make sure that the truck going through is safe because it could do really precise measurements of the depth of the, of the tire um, at that time. 
So they went out and they tried to start talking about it. It was going to be like a million dollar solution or something, a very high price solution. So they go out to a truck stop and they're going, uh, well, how do you guys at the, at the uh, way station feel about this? And the guy goes, well, we'll never buy that. And they go, why? And the guy takes a quarter out of his pocket and he walks up to a truck and he goes, that's the way we measure the tire gauge, right? You want to measure tire depth, you take a coin out and you see how deep the tire tread is. So who's going to spend a million dollars on a big heavy piece of equipment, no matter how high tech, when I can solve the problem with a, with a coin? So there's no urgency there, right? There, there's no real need for this thing because there's plenty of easier solutions. So the closer you get and make that statement compelling about your problem that you're solving, the better. Okay, so this is show and tell of one of my great failings. This was my company. And this shows you how not to do a problem statement. So we were very enamored of our technology. And I, won't even, I can't even read it because I just sort of go like, what the hell was I thinking? But um, needless to say, I, I don't understand this to this day. And I gave the pitch. I mean, it was my company. It's overly complex. It's too much about high concepts you don't really understand as opposed to how do I make a human's life better? And needless to say, I got funded. <laughs> and needless to say, it all went down the rabbit hole. That <laughs> ah, was a big smoking crater in the ground. <laughs> so we all have one, we all have one or two, you know, but that was mine. So the solution statement should be simple, conceptual uh, understanding of it. Graphical is stronger. Um, uh, a good way, picture again, worth a thousand words. Focus on the customer, not the technology, not diagrams of things, not flow charts of things. And finally, uh, so here's an illustration. Again, here's the Airbnb thing. You know, really simple. You search, you review, you book. A couple of simple pictures. That's pretty easy to understand, right? That's what we do for people. We help them search for the place they want. We help them review a bunch of listings to see which one's right for them, and they can easily book it. I'll buy that. That works. This was mine. Again, I have no idea what this means. I didn't at the time. Uh, I just sort of danced around and talked about it. But it's totally focused on our view of the world, right? It's not, there's no people in this. There's no solution for anyone. We just talked about what we built. It was a really cool platform, by the way. It was years and years ahead of its time, and nobody bought it. If we'd spent more time worrying about people and who might buy it and why they might buy it and what problem we were solving, I would have flown in on my helicopter today, but I didn't. Value statements next. Got to be tangible again, measurable, directly relevant to the customer pain and gain. Oop, let me go back. So the tangible is very important here. When people talk about benefits, if I say people want food that tastes good, does that sound like it's very relevant and measurable? Right? Not really. You always know if you're on the right track in, in a benefit statement using the absurdity principle. Reverse what you just said and see if it's absurd. So people don't want good tasting food. And so when you write one down, when you get ready for your, uh, your pitch for, for NBC, do that test and see if, it, see if it works. If there's not a number associated with it, you're probably not on the right track. I don't care what, it, what, you're, what you're pitching. If, if you're not getting more of something or less of something or saving something or whatever it is, you probably want to keep working at it. And, um, and directly relevant to the customer pain and gain. If you can't do the simple equation that says, customer X narrowly defined has this problem, I solve that problem and I get this gain for them or this benefit for them, then it, won't, it, it doesn't work. Write that down on a piece of paper when you're doing it, just like you do a formula. And if it doesn't line up, you haven't, you haven't achieved anything. So all of this stuff, the more you reduce it down to very simple bits, the better. Everybody getting this so far? Is helpful? Working? And please interrupt and ask questions um, so I can make more workshoppy. y um, so here's Airbnb again, which again, I, I, from that same deck. So if you, you guys can all find this deck online, but I've pulled some slides up for them. 
So it's a web platform that saves you money, helps you make money, and share your culture, right? So um, to your earlier point, I don't think many, many investors cared about the last point. I think they did very much care about the first point. And when you think about the genesis of Airbnb, of basically it was a guy sleeping on his friend's couch, and he was like, and I think a lot of other people are winding up like this, and I wonder if, if, if a service like that would be beneficial. Well, that was an easy sell, right? For that demographic they were initially going at, um, saying people from this age to this age that are new in a town and want to, uh, want to explore but don't have a lot of money, that's an easy sell. Make money, you got an extra room, and you don't have a lot of money, you get to make a little money. That was the initial pitch. It was very small, it was very isolated. They wanted to really just solve a problem for a certain group. It became something bigger as they, as they grew the business. But that simple um, formula statement solution um, was a winning one, right, clearly. Value propositions tend to come from one of two ways. They're gonna come from a technical insight or a market insight. Ideally, the sort of baseline, if you can show that it's lower cost or simpler, you generally can start winning. The, there's a, a saying we always used to have, better, cheaper, faster. If somebody came in and gave you a pitch and said, I'm better, I'm cheaper, I'm faster, you tended to listen to them. If somebody says, I've developed this great thing that does that, and it's wonderful, and it's the state of the art, and it's got a wireless doohickey, and it does this, nobody paid attention. You come in and say, I can make you do X 20% faster. I can save you Geico. What's Geico's pitch? 15 minutes can save you 50, uh, whatever it is or more. Yep. That's pretty dang basic, right? But it sells because it's like, oh, 15 minutes and I can save money. Um, so the unique positioning is important. So, oh, come on. There is no, as I said before, there is no such thing as no competitors. Everybody has a competitor. The, um, and like I said, the illustration I gave about, did about the, uh, about the way station, even a, a quarter might be your competitor. And if a quarter is your competitor, you got a lot of problems. Focus on, on clear differences that create value. One of the things you'll also see too is people either define the, cus the, the um, competitive base too broadly, right? You say, oh, we're a floor wax and we're a dessert topping, right? You, you can't be both, right? Well, you could. It would be a, you know, actually a pretty crappy one or the other. But it, the more complexity you add to your unique positioning, the more competitors you have to bring in. And it, so it's always good to go right at the heart of a competitor. And that's what people want. The mistake that a lot of people make when they're trying to get into business is they go, well, there's a competitor in that space. Well, for an investor, you go like, great. <laughs> because for one, we know there's somebody to sell against. So if I go in and I'm, I say, like, I'm going to go after Google Docs. And somebody actually brought this up the other day. They said, oh, well, you know, Google Docs, when they came around at first, they went right at who? Microsoft. Why did they go after Microsoft? They, Microsoft owned the market, right, for things like Word. So why, what did Google do to go right at Microsoft? Huh? Made it shareable. Made it shareable. What was, yeah. Now, did Microsoft have that capability? Yeah, no, they did. But Microsoft was a legacy product that was so laden with features, and it was so mature, that, that all the people that were using it might have overlooked some of the new innovations they did every time they would release. They'd promote it, but you just kept using it the same way. So a new entrant in the market says, I don't have to have everything, I just have to have the thing they don't have. So what does Google play up? Collaboration. There was a young person on the panel that, that initially brought it up, and she was just talking about how well, that, this was Google, they just got it. Google really got it, and I brought up the point. It's like, no, Microsoft had it. It's just that when you're the new entrant, you wanna go right at the weak spot of your competitor, right? The, find that vulnerability and go after it. So when you're making a presentation or when you're talking to an investor, if you say, here's six things that they do and we're gonna do five of them better. I hate those slides. Nobody ever reads those slides when you're talking about six things you do and you, and, and you do two better, right? It's worthless. 
You want to hit right at their Achilles heel. You want, God dang it, man, this thing. Somebody jumped up from the ground and tried to tackle me. You saw it. Um, so um, you want to really uh, find that weak spot, and you want to hammer the heck out of it. Microsoft Word doesn't have collaboration, even though they do. The mark, tell the market that they don't have it, and that's the reason to use Google Docs. So people will forgive the fact that your functionality is not as good. They'll forgive the fact that there was big latency in, in Google Docs when it originally came out. It was a pain in the neck to use because that was the way to collaborate, and that's the way people perceive it now. Go right at them. That's what you want to do. Find the weak spot and go for it. Come on. OK, so the exciting action, what the audience really wants to hear. What gets investors excited? Business models. Business models, business models. It's all they care about. They want to know that you're going into a market that's growing, right? So if I come out with a way to go to a market and I know that that market's getting big, right? That's what I want to hear. That's lots of zeros. And you've validated what you're doing. So saying that, so if you notice, how many of you have ever, uh, when, you, when you were thinking about what you were submitting last week, said, well, it's a $4 billion market, right? Well, if I get 1% of a $4 billion market, that's a lot of money. Trust me, even investors can do that math. You give a bunch of zeros, you shave off a couple of zeros, you still have a lot of zeros. That really sounds impressive. But it's really not helpful. <laughs> what they really want to do is they want to know, uh, as I always say, we can add zeros. What we really want to know is can you sell to one person effectively? Because if you can sell to one person effectively, I can do the rest of the math. The validation of the model is a reality of today's market. Now, at the end of the 90s, when I was handing out checks, the world was in a frenzy to try to get the most businesses started and deploy capital the, the fastest they could. In fact, my venture fund was funded by two very large private equity firms that wanted to get early stage, and they were looking for somebody to get there until the market crashed in 2000, and they wanted to get their money back, which was a sad story for me. But the, the truth of the matter is, is nowadays, people want to see validation. They want to see that you made that one sale you said you could do in your revenue model. They wanted to see that it cost you a dollar to acquire somebody, and that you will make four dollars off of them. So, and you have to show that you've done it. Doesn't mean you have to have done it to the point where you don't need their money, because what they really want to fund is a successful business model that's going to grow, not you to go build a product so you can see if it works. They don't do that anymore. You got to build your product. You got to prove that it works. And that, last but not least, what gets them excited is a big exit. That's all they care. I mean, think about it. They're not there to give you money. They're there to make money off of you. So if they can't get their money out, there's no reason to put it in. So the exit is a very important part of your pitch. So if you can't make money on one transaction, how do you make it on a million? Cannot tell you the number of times somebody has given me that pitch where I lose money on every transaction, but I make it up in volume. Right? It's like, no, you don't. You're just a big gaping hole for me to dump money down into. I'm not investing in big gaping holes. So if you can't make money off of that one trend, and then the other prop uh, solution people do, and I always love this, is they don't make money off of the first product, but the second and third products are pretty amazing. It's like, well, well then do the second and third products. Why do I have to do the first one? Now, that's because we're here. In Silicon Valley, I think you come up with your latte. Um, you tighten up your man bun and you go in and go like, no, man, everybody's going to be doing this. It's going to be like, oh, I can't believe it. And they give you $50 million to see if you're right. I can't help you that this place is not like that. I mean, they want real business models. They want to make sure that you can sell. So in your pitch, prove to them that you make money off that transaction. Prove it. Here's a way to do it. How much does it cost to acquire a customer? So if, it, if you, one, and they have a great BS meter on this, so be careful about this. How much do you have to spend to get you how many new customers? So here's a great story. Anybody remember America Online? All right, so I was at America Online. That's one of my little claim to fame. I was one of the early guys at America Online. 
And our competitor at that point was Prodigy. And Prodigy used to go out and say, they, they would actually talk about this, that it cost them $400 for every new subscriber. $400. Well, you could do the math. That, well, wait, you're charging $9.95 a month. Well, nobody's hanging around for that for 40 months for you to get bro broken even, right? And their dream was that they were going to find a bunch of other ways for people to spend money, and it never really worked out. What was funny was we at AOL were at about $65, right? At nine bucks a month, we made money in the first year. What was even funnier was Prodigy, one of the ways they wanted to make money was uh, not spending money, so they didn't have a software download uh, so, uh, capability. And that was the big thing back then. You would download art or you would download a program. So Prodigy, not having one, said, well, this America Online group, you guys are kind of small. You're just sort of struggling. Why don't you be our software download area? So we're like, OK. So 15% of the signups in AOL in the early days were coming from Prodigy. They were coming from our competitor, who was spending $400 to acquire a customer and then giving them to us for free. That gets investors excited. <laughs> I think we got public on that alone. But you want to show, so the bottom line on that is, inside of that customer acquisition cost is a lot of strategy bundled in that one little number. How do you keep the total amount you spend down? That's why you have channels. That's why you work with people. That's why you partner, to keep that dollar amount down. That's why you want to be very effective and very targeted. Because if I say I'm going after seven customer segments, guess what? There's no flipping way to keep that top number low. But if I'm going after a very dedicated segment, and I know how to get them, then I, know I can keep that dollar amount low. And do you mind, Sarah, if I use your example? So Sarah is a, a friend of mine, and, and um, she works, I work with her um, in, in what, my day job. And she's opening a new kind of nanny uh, kind of service for selection of nanny and placement of nannies. And she's correctly co come up with a way to go hyper-local on it and to, to go very narrow on a, on a set of, of people to start, which um, is higher-end uh, folks. They spend more money. They tend to be people that will spend a lot of money uh, getting a nanny. And you might say, well, yeah, but, why not, but lots of other people could use a nanny. Yes, but in the initial go-to-market, she can go and hand postcards. She showed them to me, just little, little printed postcards, and go around to places like, like fertility clinics and OBGYN's offices and delivery rooms and hospitals and say, I'm going to help you get that, that, uh, that nanny. And I'm going to help you do it better, cheaper, and faster than the current solutions. So she's going to know, in pretty short order, if, her, if she's pegged the customer right, and her cost of acquisition is going to be very low for the early adopter in her market, right? So even if she doesn't get huge numbers, when she comes to me as an investor, and don't come to me as an investor, you can't, I can't invest in you. But when she goes to that investor, she's going to go, look, I spent $1,000 printing up cards and handing them out, walking around to places, and I got, I got 30 customers out of it. 30 paying customers, 10 paying, even 10 paying customers. That's a $100 acquisition cost. If, you're, if your product on your average revenue from that customer then winds up being something on the order of $1,000 or $2,000, sign me up. That's a business that's going to do great. You have plenty of room to discount, right? Oh, 1000 bucks. Oh, they don't want it 1000 bucks. I got to give a 50% off. OK, it still costs you 100 bucks to get 500 bucks. So, the, so these numbers are very simple. But what goes behind them is very complex. Does everybody get that? So an investor wants to see first this, how much does it cost you to get a new customer? And then they're going to want to know your lifetime value of that customer. And again, baked into this is a lot of your strategy. So for instance, how many years does the customer stay with you? How much money does the customer spend per year, right? How much are you going to make off of that person? I would say a 10% gross margin is not what I'd be looking for, but that's another thing. What's the lifetime gross profit? What's my acquisition cost? So if I spend $8 to get a customer and my lifetime gross profit is $84, this is a good deal. This looks like this could work, right? It may not be the best deal because I don't like that gross margin. But again, a lot of strategy is packed into a very simple equation here. Well, why do I get 280? Could it go up? Right? Could I offer additional services? Do I want a price lower, 
even to the point of free, right? That's the freemium model. Freemium models are not I give my product away. Freemium models is I get you to try very limited functionality to get you in so that you start paying me money for multiple years, right? So it also may be inducements for the first sale. Free ride on Uber, try us out. Download the app and try us out just once. I liked it, I try it again. So strategy and tactics have to go behind this, but ultimately the equation is very simple. You wanna see something that's gonna get multiple years, stable or rising revenue per customer, and a low acquisition cost. Think about it, after that, it's just a bunch of zeros at the end, right? To, to see if it's a big business or not. So then you also have to show that though. Well, here's another example. I liked this one. It was very, very clean, very succinct for a company called Wine Simple and they published it. So this is, we're gonna deliver wine to your house. So we know what the wine costs, we know what the shipping costs, we have to do compliance, make Uncle Sam happy. We know what it costs for credit card processing. So we know out of, the, out of that uh, 20, uh, 45 bucks, we're gonna make 16, uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna add 16% of margin, which means we're gonna charge 89 bucks. So I had, um, she's not here, the young lady that, um, I don't see her. Uh, one of the young ladies that came to see me as a mentor in residence had a neat, uh, has a neat idea, I think. Um, I don't know if she'll go forward, but I thought this was a neat idea, and she's not here, so she can't tell me not to say it. <laughs> it was a gift idea. And the thing that was novel about this gift idea, it was sort of last minute nice gifts. So when, uh, when you're my age, or actually younger, <laughs> of course, cause now I don't care, but when I cared and I had friends, um, <laughs> I would go out to parties, and you're on the way to the party, and you're busy, you haven't had time to do anything, and it's like, oh, geez, we forgot to get a gift, right? Get a bottle of wine, get a bouquet of flowers, get, get some neat knick-knack from a local store that's gonna be kind of special spice things or something, something. So this sort of fits into that mode, right? So if I buy a $20 bottle of wine, and I wanna bring it to your house, but I'm really pressed for time, do you think I'd spend $45 for that bottle of wine or $50 for that bottle of wine if you hand delivered it to me so I could just go? I probably would, right? If I don't have to worry about driving to the store and being late and not able to get ready and I have the disposable income to not care, right? So now, you may not do that because you may not want to spend $45 on a gift and it's easier to do something, but I might. And what would be the difference there? Well, maybe I'm a little more established. Maybe I have a little more income. Right, maybe a little bit further on in life. So I don't mind spending that disposable income. So again, if we define the customer right and we define the, the story right, it starts to make sense when maybe it didn't. So I, I like that as a good illustration of a type of uh, model that can work. So, so now we've established that I can make money and I, on every customer I sell. This is where you add the zeros, right? So now, if I say that I'm gonna, um, so let's go back to Sarah's example. So now I've got a nanny service, and in, if, in just in Fairfax County, let's say, I go out and sell it, and I can prove that in a place like Fairfax County, I can spend $1,000, and I can make 10000 right? Pretty good bet. Then it's pretty easy for me to go, well, that's just Fairfax County. If I just go the whole Washington, D.C. area, I'm really talking about 45000 or 500000 if I'm talking about regionally, I'm talking about um, $3 million. If I blow this up nationally, I'm talking about 10, 15 million a year. Investors like that kind of math. They like to see the small building block and where that grows into. And this is a case of, um, in, uh, this was Citrix, talking about app visualization and how that market would grow. And you start, and a lot of times you'll look at a market and you'll see, oh, well, the market's like a billion dollars. And you go like, well, maybe I won't, you know, it's a whole market's only like 500, 500, uh, $500 million. Maybe it's not worth me getting into. But if in, in this case, in 11 years, it's not 500 million, it's gonna be 10, 20 billion, well, then that's a great market to get in. And investors wanna understand that and they'll go along for the ride based on how the market's gonna develop. Make sense? So. The big finish, you gotta have a big finish, right? You want the, this is the Star Wars scene where they once again go and blow up a Death Star thing with a little port somewhere that nobody else figured out but them. It's made about a billion, well, how many billions of dollars off of that same plot line, it's just amazing. That's the job I should have had. 
<laughs> I wish I came up with that idea. Uh, I just wasted my youth going to watch it. Um, so you want to give the audience what they want. That's the big opportunity. So how do you seal the deal? Realistic and attractive financial projections, right? So a uh, little, little anecdotal story about that. So one time somebody's pitching me and looking for money, and the, there was an incredible growth story. I mean, it was the hockey stick of all hockey sticks, and the guy's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this works. And I go, I know that doesn't work. I know that your model's a bunch of BS. And he goes, no, 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 man, I built this model from the ground up. I said, I can tell you it doesn't work. And he kept arguing with us, and I'm like, open up the model. So in the middle of the presentation, we had him open up his business model. And, and you, could, you knew where the, where the variable was screwed up. So I go, okay, we'll go flip, keep flip, let me see. Okay, click on that cell. And what he'd done is he took a, he had a growth factor in there. And instead of making the growth factor stable or making it a step function increased year to year, he just dragged it across. He just did a fill. So the next thing you know, he's getting three, four times growth per month. It's like, yeah, just wasn't going to work. So he, he, he was shot down. And he tried to make it too complex. He managed, tried to manage too many variables. And in the process, made it so that he couldn't get the money. And he didn't get the money. An exit that's attractive and reasonable. Know your market. Know who's going to buy your company. And know how they, sell, how they buy. So I talked to somebody in my job the other day that um, had a consulting firm. And he was looking to sell one element. It was a training and, cons uh, and, and, and consulting part to get into a more attractive foreign business. He was getting into security sales in the Middle East. He says, well, I want to sell this business. Well, how much are you making on the business? Well, he's making about a half million, uh, about making a quarter million on, I think, uh, like 800, let's say, for the sake of argument. So I'm like, well, what's, do you have any technology? No. How do you make the money? Well, we come in and we consult with them and we, we work on that. I said, oh, when's your contracts ending? And they were going to end in another year. They was going to like phase, the contracts were going to start phasing out. I go, well, you can't get one times revenue for that. You're not going to get eight, you're not going to get three million for that. You're going to get $400,000 on that. So instead of selling his business, I convinced him to hold on to the business, take the profits he was getting from that business if he just stayed in there and just didn't screw it up. And he could self-fund the new operation and go to another market, right? So if your business is heavily uh, laden with services, nobody pays you a multiple on services. Because if you think about it, if I have to have a human deliver every time I sell, I, every time I deliver my product, there's no scale to that. Investors pay for scale. That means one human serves 10 rooms, right? It means that, that, if I'm, that, that the infrastructure that I'm going to take investor money to build is scalable to the point where I can serve the world, because they can do that math. That's why people invest in technology. That's why technology investments get so much more benefit. And a defensible market position is why do pharmaceutical companies get all the money they get. Because not only are they um, a real te technological innovation, but the government has decided to grant them monopolistic pricing power. To, to earn back their investment. So while it's highly risky, if I make that investment, I know that many times, even before it goes through FDA approval, somebody's going to buy that drug if it looks like it's going to get through. That's lots. That's big multiples. And that's, what, that's the difference. They want a team that can deliver. One of the misconceptions is that investors invest in technologies, and they don't. They invest in business models and teams that can deliver them. There was a funny time when MITRE, uh, the big uh, think tank out there in research think tank out in Virginia, used to invite people like me out there. And they'd come up and they'd give us this presentation of all their technology. And they'd go, well, isn't this technology great? Which ones do you guys want to invest in? And this one uh, VC from town raised in. He goes, look, I don't invest in technologies. I invest in teams. So if you have, um, you know, some, some of you have come to me that, that I, I recognize in this room and say, well, it's just me. Well, in the early parts of the competition, you can get by. But if you ever get to the point where you're going to start looking for money, people don't want just you. They're going to want to see a team that can deliver on the, on, the, on the business model. So it's very important how you structure that. They can't be feet and seats. And they also shouldn't be some bloated organization that's the way you think people want to see it. It should be the right people to execute the right plan. And that doesn't have to be a lot of people, but it should be the right people. And then an ask that's sensible. 
Um, a lot of people fall down on this. I want, I would like to get $1 million at a $20 million pre-money valuation to fund my company, and you normally get a chuckle. Um, but I was part of a company, I helped found a company that actually got, uh, actually got that. It was actually, I think, though, though, two or three million on a 20 million pre-money valuation. And I was just like amazed that they got it. And of course, they lost money for their investors because that was so high. That's an unreasonable ask. You generally want to look at the state of your business, how much revenue you're gaining, you're generating, and you want to make sure you're getting the money you need. Do you ask for increases? Good point. You may, you, you, you definitely have to ask for what you need, right? They just don't want to, oh yeah, give me some money. <laughs> you got to know what you want the money for, right? And that's why it's important to have a good budget around that. And I think I have an example of that. I do. Here's simple financials. Very easy to understand. I'll go back to that in a second, though, because in answer to your question, that's a valuation. No, I didn't include it. Sorry. Um, they're normally looking for a budget from you. So I want a million dollars, and um, so I've been I've been on in this business, and uh, despite telling the CEO not to do it. So I want a million dollars, and I'm going to pay me and my buddy and this other guy $150 a year, $150,000 a year. So I'm the investor. I'm saying, you want me to give, me to give you a million and four fifty? dollars That's going to get flushed out before you guys deliver anything. Now, there's been times that people invest in those things, but I don't. I want all the money in the business. I want you to, you know. So it has to be reasonable what you're asking for. And it has to be budgeted for precisely the things you need to execute the business plan, not the money you would like to hold on to. Right? And, and what you want to give in terms of a benchmark for the valuation, yes, you do generally ask. So you might say, I want a million dollars at a three million uh, pre to sell 25% of the company. And what I'm going to deliver for that is I'm going to have a product in the market. I'm going to get sales of X amount. And we're going to be able to roll to the next level. And, and then a timeline that you're going to want that money for. And that money will last. And, and if it doesn't last more than 12 months, forget about it. Because you, the, nobody believes that because you're going to be out raising money again. So generally, you want, you want enough money that you're going to get 18 months of, of runway. Um, you talked about valuation in terms of what offers and are in line with the valuation. Sure. Yep. And I've had a question. People, you know, ROI is, let's put that aside, because somebody investing in a startup generally isn't looking for, it, 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 you're looking for ROI, a benchmark you would like to get um, but from doing your early stage investment. Asking somebody to tell you what the return on investment is in a startup but pre-revenue company is kind of crazy, right? Because you don't know how the market's going to evolve. You don't know the timing of it. I mean, if you know how an ROI investment goes, you got to know what's the base What's the exit? Over what period of time? What compound interest rate are you comparing it against? So it, it's, it's tough to ever give that. But valuation is something different. And, and, and um, not surprisingly, value is in the eye of the beholder. Um, if you go and pitch somebody very friendly that really believes in you, uh, if you find an angel that doesn't mind taking, taking the, 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 the chance on you, they might give you a higher valuation. But, um, and then you might go to an institutional investor that, that uh, is seeing a bunch of different deals. And if you haven't blown them away, they're going to be very hard on you. For, so it's, very, it's, it's hard to say there's a precise science to it. Generally, though, what you can bet is if you start from the bottom up and you determine what money you need, and then you look at the other side and say, well, how much of my company am I prepared to sell? Right? So that's the balance that, in, that a, a startup person always has to do. All right, I need a, I need a half, I got to get a half a million dollars. Of, I, I, I absolutely have to, but I don't want to give up a lot of my company. So you might say, okay, I want a half million bucks and I'll do it for you at two million, right? So now I'm not selling too much of my company. People will do that because the ask wasn't that big and the, the underlying valuation is not that extreme, right? It's sort of you get an A for effort. You get like, okay, yeah, you're worth two million. Have a nice day. Um, so it really kind of works that way. It's how much money do you really need, um, and then how much of your company do you want to sell? And you kind of work those two variables. 
I can tell you that. Um, what about your team? Huh? What about your team? What do you mean? What about your team? Like your team, your, your that that can help. That can help. I I have gone out and just gotten five million dollars for just for playing because people trust trusted that I wouldn't lose their money and I lost their money. <laughs> so uh, they expect to lose their money. They're in the business of losing money. Well, it wouldn't be a quarter in that case. It would be um, 20%. Yeah, if I, if I did, the simple one is if, I, if, I sell, if my pre-money valuation is $3 million and I ask for a million, then at the end, I own one quarter of the after-money valuation. That's the way you calculate it. So, but, but, uh, so what was the rest of your question there? Then you tr go as far as you can with that until the next time you raise money. And then if you're a rocket ship to the moon, you go, oh, my next valuation is, my, I've created all this value in my company, so now I'm going to raise $5 million at $20 million, so I'll sell another quarter of my company. But if you haven't. So if you raise that value, what does that initial investor always own that same? No, that is called dilution. And what will happen in a case like that, if, uh, if you have a really um, hard-nosed negotiator on the other end, they will ask for something called anti-dilution rights, which means if you're going to go out and sell that high a valuation and that, look for that money, I want my anti-dilution rights, which allows them to throw money in the pot to mitigate the effects of that new money coming in. That's a whole different lecture. The, the, I mean, and... It, it gets brutal and ugly, and the lawyers get involved, and then lawyers come up with interesting ways that, no, you're going to get that value, but we're going to give you warrants, and the warrants are exercisable at this point in time, except we're going to give you the, you know, it's like it gets nuts. So um, there, it's an art. It's not a, I mean, there's, just, there's math to it, but how you manage um, your investors over the course of the, of the ownership of a company is, you know, it, it it varies by the company and the success it has. It varies on your creativity and your lawyer's creativity um, to, to maximize your ownership as the, as the CEO of a company. But I mean, just, just to give you an idea, it's not surprising to see a CEO that comes up with an idea and they start a company that they own 100% of wind up with 10% of a company at the end of the day. Not, not surprising at all. In fact, if you go to what, um, what Zuckerberg did, he did um, like one of, the, one of the really cool deals of all time where he basically cooked his percentage of the company that uh, basically said, my, I, I won't fall below this amount of ownership in my company. But that's when you're Mark Zuckerberg and when Microsoft comes in and dumps $150 billion or whatever they dumped into his company, $150 million bucks on a you know, multi-billion dollar valuation. You can get away with stuff like that. Um, like this is the Death Star, this is a, you know, it destroys planets, this is a thermal exhaust port, we got that covered. Not, uh, it, it, eventually you get there. Right. Not generally on the first pitch. Um, there's, there's too much honesty, and, and sometimes I've been guilty of that, of just sort of see, showing them I see all sides of it. And the first, the first date, they don't really want you to tell them all sides of it. Um, what will happen is if you go through and you get through a couple of rounds, what's going to happen is they're going to do due diligence, which means uh, they send in a bunch of uh, Ivy League guys that come in and make you uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, I've had guys come in and just like rip my model apart and start rebuilding my model in front of me. <laughs> and I'm going like, well, no, 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 wait, that variable's right. No, it's not. You know, we're going to do it. Um, or your technology, they, they'll sit in a room and they'll bring some smart guys in that says your technology's terrible. No one would ever want it. And what were you thinking of? And they'll, believe me, if they're interested enough in you, they will, they will try to pry it open. Now, in your first time out and when you're first raising money in, in a kind of seed round, especially if you get um, favorable uh, angels that, that like you, like the space and just are a little less, um, you know, 
uh, draconian in their valuation, value equation, their return equation. Um, a lot of times you can be more open with them and you'll talk about them, and a lot of times they won't even press real hard. But once you get into the institutional rounds, there's generally some smart person that's going to try to find the crack in the armor. So don't give it to them ahead of time. It'll come out soon enough. Um, anything else? Okay, I'll keep going. So simple financials. You, 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 m many of you have probably seen the whole spreadsheet that gets lifted out of, out of Excel and posted on a page. Investors really don't need that. Um, they'll have plenty of time during due diligence to go and, and go through with a fine tooth comb your business model. What they really want to know is basically how much, you know, business is fundamentally simple. Make more money than you spend, right? So not like they won't have serious questions about some of the variables and some of the assumptions you've made. That's different. But what you want to show them and talk about is something at a very high level that's easy for them to understand. Because I can look at this and I can say, OK, you're losing 100 and, 180,000 uh, or million, we don't care what it is. Let's say it's 180,000. You're going to lose 180,000 this year. You make 120 next year. I'm betting you're in the 220 to, um, to $300,000 you're going to lose total before you start making money. And the CEO can say, yeah, you're right. That's how much money I'm going to need. OK, so why do you need five? Well, because I'm going to lose that much money over that period of time. But I want 200 additional working capital because we know things never happen on time. We know that it's my, I might not get the hires in when I need. I might not make the sales on time. Investor goes, that's pretty reasonable. I don't mind that. I don't mind you having some money left over. But if you say, I need $20 million, and you show them this, and they go, like, wait a second. You're only going to lose that much money. Why would you take that much money? And they're going, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to feel much better about myself if I said I raised 20 million bucks. <laughs> I have also been that guy. <laughs> I wasn't that guy. I worked with a CEO that was that guy. And it's like, we don't need this money. Oh, yeah, we do. We do, we do. We're not going to get out to Kleiner Perkins if we don't do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going to get to Kleiner Perkins, trust me, anyway. So be humble about what your ask is. Make sure it's the money you need. Show very simply why you need it, and people will give it to you. The, um, one of the, the time-honored traditions of, of in, uh, investment decks is the uh, hockey stick. I can tell you that, that I spent many an evening making the hockey stick work, no matter how unrealistic it was or how much of a lie it was to how my business was actually going to go. People don't really care that much about that. They're really kind of interested in understanding the dynamics. And the thing about this is this is actually a pretty simple graph that helps you understand there's operating income, there's net income after tax. And I can look at this and say, OK, you're going to lose 1.5 there, you're going to lose 1.4 there. But then you're going to start making some pretty good returns uh, net after tax, and your revenue growth line goes up. That, that's, if, the, if the underlying assumptions to that are pretty good, that's a, that's a good bet. You don't have to also show people 20 years of financials. Because remember, if we start with that basic building block of how the very basics, how much it costs me to acquire a customer, and how much I make lifetime value. Again, I can add the zeros. I just want to get a feel for how fast you think this, this starts to take off, and how much total money you're going to need. right? Because one of the things people don't understand about investors is investors, especially if you go to an institutional investor, <coughs> they're in the business of deploying capital. If you go to them and say, well, I only need $1 million, my business will be successful, they'll say, great, go get a loan. Right? But if you say, if you give me $15 million or $20 million over the course of total investment in this business over five years, and at the end of that time, I'm doing $217 million, they go, hey, that's not a bad bet, especially if the multiple on that revenue is five times. Right? So if I'm a billion-dollar company and I only had to put $20 million into it, I'm the smartest guy at my golf club. Right? I get the Mercedes-Benz. That's how simple the, the math is, but how difficult it is many times to tell the story. This is a fun thing. And, and uh, look at the sector you're in. Again, define the sector you're in well. This talks about exit comps. So for instance, here's somebody that uh, total known funding, $570 million. They exited for $3.3 billion. Sound OK? You guys like that? Not bad, right? Not bad. Um, here's somebody, 148 million raised, did a, a billion dollar out. Again, not bad, pretty good. Uh, There's one down here that wasn't too good. Where was it? Uh, well, you get down here and you get 231 million raised and 300 million out. Does that sound good? 
That doesn't sound very good. Going back to your question about ROI, I can do that ROI calculation, right? So when I say to you, like, when an investor says, what's the ROI? A better response to an investor like that and a better thing to put in your deck is to understand the sector you're in and what an expected multiple is going to be. Either now, it may be hard early on in a business that's growing to do a multiple on, on EBITDA. Ever know what EBITDA is? Your earnings before interest, tax, depreciation. Um, it might be hard to do that because you might be growing, you might be swallowing all that money, so you may not be making any money at all. So many times in growth investing like this, people are looking at your top line multiple, which means if I make a dollar, I can sell the business for 10. There was one in there, I thought, I don't know if I saw that. No, it wasn't in there. So some businesses, like media businesses, used to sell for uh, when, when, um, when Yahoo went public, I think it was, their valuation was 18 times their revenue, right? So when businesses have very large growth potential, excuse me, um, and they, they are serving massive markets, the multiples get very high. If your business is something that you're saying, uh, I'm gonna offer the, uh, open a coffee stand out there, where I got my coffee. And you say, well, I'm going to open this coffee stand. I go, OK, well, I can, the multiple on that's not going to be very high, right? Because anybody can build a coffee stand there. You can only serve so many people, so I'm not going to give you a high multiple. Now, that might change if I come up with the brand like Starbucks, and I'm going to have 3,000 of these things across the world, or, th or 10,000 across the world. It's still basically a glorified coffee stand, but the brand equity, that intangible brand equity, the reach of that, the loyalty, the market uh, barrier that they've created mean that the valuation on the top line just goes up. You get multiples on it. That, that makes sense to people? That's the, that's the way it works. All right, other things to mention. Uh, always know who the logical acquirer is. I have not ever been in, an, in a pitch where somebody goes, who buys this thing? And I cannot tell you the number of times I didn't have a good answer. <laughs> I wish I'd had a good answer. And I didn't, you know, I, it's one of those things that you don't think about, but it's always important to know. You want to go in there and say, I need this money. I think the total business is going to require 15, 20 million. I think it sells in five, uh, uh, well, now businesses don't sell till eight to 10 years. I think I sell in eight to 10 years for 10 times multiple to major player in my space X because they, they are growing through acquisition. Or if you get the holy grail and you can say, I'm going to go public, I think this thing has the kind of legs that can go public, then their eyes glisten and they want to, they want to take you out and buy you things. <laughs> but uh, those are harder and harder to do these days. Um, what do the sales metrics look like in this space? Um, understand how people sell in the space. Understand like the things that they can easily look up. If you don't know the answer and they look it up, you look stupid, right? So know how the metrics work. Know, know how the metrics in your space look. If, if, if you say, I can acquire a customer for $40, and the industry standard, and they can easily Google and find an article that says the average is $500, you just look stupid. I can't tell you the number of times I've had somebody go, oh, yeah, we're going to do this by direct sales. Oh, direct sales. How much does your product cost? We get $10,000 a year. Well, wait a second. I know the metrics behind direct sales. How much does your sales guy cost? Well, you know, I might have to pay $250 to get a really good sales guy. Yeah, and what's the commission for that guy? Oh, and they're normally going to work off of a 5% commission on closed sales. OK, so this guy's going to earn the better part of $350,000 a year, and you're going to get $10,000 per sales. How many sales is that guy going to make? Well, they'll make 20 sales per year. Well, you start, it's a pretty easy piece of math to break down to say that you don't understand how you're going to sell, you're not pricing your product right, and so on and so forth. So an investor wants you to come at them and understand the market and understand the metrics around it. Um, how much money will you ultimately need? So I talked about that before. Um, nobody wants to hear that you only have to earn a, uh, need a million dollars to make your business work. I have done a few of those because I actually, the zone that I tended to work in when I started businesses or helped businesses were ones that could be turned over more quickly and weren't really capitally intensive. 
and were designed basically to be sold to somebody in the space. So I sold a business to AOL, sold a business to Khaki, sold a business to Navtech, which was then became um, Nokia. Um, we were always building the business to be positioned to get sold, right? So I'd say, yeah, I just need this much money because I'm just going to get this far enough in the market. I'm going to go right at this competitor, and this competitor is going to take me out. But at the, if you're trying to go for something big, it, it changes, and your needs might work. What time frame is really important? used to be it took about five years from the time you took your first money to the time somebody would want to buy you. That was my model. I worked with a bunch of <laughs> I'm telling you, that thing's coming after me. I worked with a bunch of different startups. My model was great. I didn't have to get a lot of money into them. I could sell them in five years. I made pretty good money. Then what happened was Sarbanes-Oxley came along, your government, your buddy the government, and they made it so that it was harder to go public, right? So that actually started stretching out the length of time that you had to work with a company, and it eliminated the public option for a lot of companies. Then 2008 happened, and people started getting a little more risk-averse, so they stopped putting a little uh, more money to, uh, at play right away, and that stretched it out. So now it's like eight to 10 years from, a start, from the initial money to getting out. So if you don't know that time frame, and you go and say, I think I sell this business in three years and everybody loves me, doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but they're gonna be more skeptical about it. And when you ask them to take a bigger risk, what do you think they want? Bigger reward. The more risk you ask them to take, they don't just give that away. They find ways to take it out of your hide. So the more reasonable, the better. The team slide, we talked about the team slide. Never spend a huge amount of time on the team slide. Don't list everybody, you know. Here's Jason, he gets coffee for us. That's not helpful, they don't care about that. Think about the main drivers in your business. What are the main metrics that, that make your business work? Who do you have to have on staff to make that work, whether it's developer, salesperson, I don't care. And if that person is enlisted there, they're degrading you. They're gonna discount how much you should get, they're gonna discount your value. And then, the pièce de résistance, we're almost done. Um, telling them how much you need the ask, right? This is a sales pitch, you have to have an ask. So when you get there, you gotta say how much you need, how far it takes, and how you will spend it. And then the valuation or terms that you would prefer as you do this. Here's a good example of one. It, um, it basically takes you through all of those things and it's very nicely laid out. It's a busy slide. I normally don't like busy slides, but in this case, it's worthwhile. It tells you you need $600,000. You're prepared to sell 20% of your company. They can do that math easily and figure out what you're, what you're looking for. Um, it tells you that you're, uh, uh, you're gonna do a four times multiplier. That tells you what the industry standard is um, and that you're um, conservative below the standard industry multipliers. It tells you what you want the money for. That gives an investor everything they need to, to measure the, the, um, the, the, the reasonableness of your ask, um, the practicality of it, and to know that, that you're just not asking for money. No. I mean, they want to see that going one Think about it from their perspective, right? You're looking, you're trying to maximize the amount of your company you hold on to, right? They're not hiring you to do it. They're not hiring you for a job. This is not a job interview. This is somebody giving you money. So they, what has changed, when I first started doing this stuff, nobody wanted you to take any money out at all. It was basically go starve for a couple of years, and then if you're making any traction, we'll start to pay you. So I can tell you of some uncomfortable conversations with my wife over the years of going, no, it'll really work out, hon, honestly, trust me. Um, but now they don't do that as much. Now nobody wants you to starve, and they know that it takes longer to do. But they don't want you paying yourself market. Now that actually makes it tough to run a business in DC, because there's Uncle Sugar out there, for one, and there's, an, uh, there's actually all the people that serve that, and there's all of these, um, there's plenty of places to earn a lot of money, right? Um, when I started one of my businesses, we went to go get developers. 
and we were going for top-notch talent. Now, in Silicon Valley, they might have taken that risk, but around here, they go, look, I'm getting paid $240,000 a year working at IBM. Why should I take 100000 to work for you? That's a good point. I was like, yeah, if I can make $240,000, I might not do this job either. So what they want to make sure is you got enough so that you're not starving, because they don't want you to starve, because if you starve, you leave. But they also want to make sure that their money's not just, that you're, they're not create, you're not creating a pass through to you, and the money's not staying in the business. You get that? It's a balance, it's always a balancing act. So it's not starving. It's a good point. I, I read a book before I ever started doing this years and years ago that uh, encouraged entrepreneurs to um, create a budget of the things that absolutely don't get you evicted. So mortgage gets you evicted, can kill your credit rating, which can actually hurt you getting uh, uh, capital for your business. So people don't want that to happen. So um, you don't, that's what they're going to look at. What's your, what's your, uh, what do you need to eat? What do you need to, to keep housed and, and a car? They might even, they might even say, we'll, we'll pay for the car, right? They, they, they might say, hey, put, charge the car off in the business. We don't care. That's all variable, right? They just want to make sure that you're not going to quit. And I've had that happen. I've, I've worked with an entrepreneur. I helped him with his initial idea. Uh, I was part of the management team. We were just starting to get some traction, but the money was running out. And he was at a point in life where they wanted to have kids. He was a young guy. They wanted to have kids. And he's like, I can't keep doing this. I'm like, well, somebody's got to. <laughs> but he couldn't. He really couldn't afford to do it. So investors don't want that to happen. But they don't want you to live in large either. So. Um, if you have a service company, then I would imagine it would be acceptable to have you know, the services True. That, no, that's right. That's a good point. If, uh, and the question was, if your company is, uh, is a service company or dependent on services, will they flinch at paying those people? And, they, and the, the answer is no. Because the people that might be delivering will tend to be getting lower salaries than the management team. And they're critical to the delivery of the product. Now, the downside of that is, is that service, the higher the service component, the less the revenue multiple, which may make it a less interesting investment. But... Um, give you an example. Most software companies nowadays make money off of services, not software. It's, a, it's just a fact of life. There's more money to be made helping people use your software, uh, doing integrations and things like that than there is selling software. So people are used to those kind of components inside of a business plan. Now, even then, depending on how good your software platform is, you might have a three or four times multiple on your revenues. So they might go, look, pay those people. We don't care. Make sure you get the best to be delivering the product and service. Um, but you don't get anything. You get starvation diet. And hey, you know, if it wasn't painful, it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> this, is, this is not the, the route you take if you want an easy out, believe me. <laughs> so the exit slide, uh, we went through that um, time frame. So that's good. Um, don't do an ugly deck. Some other quick points. Um, fewer data points per slide, the better. What you want, you don't want them reading your slide. You want them looking at you. You want them thinking about what you're saying. You want them to engage with you. If they're reading your slide or trying to say, what does that say there? They've just stopped listening to you. So pretty decks, visual decks, uh, simple stuff on it makes sense. Um, Organize in the best way to tell your story. Again, going off into esoteric tangents, going off into, into in-depth descriptions about your product cannot tell you the number of times. I actually almost got in a fist fight with some guy that was presenting for me one time because he would never get off the slide on his product. And I'm like, I still didn't know who he was selling to. I didn't know why anybody cared. And I just kept going, OK, I get it. You can move on. No, but you don't know how it works. I'm like, well, I don't care how it works. Please, just tell me what you're going to do. Uh, you are not letting me tell you about what I do. And I'm like, I don't care what you do. And he, he, it was terrible. It was ugly. It was just like one of us had to leave the room. And I had the money, so guess who left the room? Um, never forget uh, that you're a performer. 
I mean, even if you're sitting in a room one-on-one -on -one with somebody, right? If you are not confident, if you're not projecting that you know your stuff, if you're not quick with answers, if you don't have a grasp of the facts, and if you're not entertaining, you're gonna lose them, right? Like I may have lost many of you. I, I always wonder when the people left, oh, did I lose you? No, I hope not. You know, you, you, wanna, you wanna keep them engaged, you wanna be interesting. And um, remember why you're there. It's very easy to get lost in our own world. It's very easy to get lost in what we, our invention or in the anecdote we're telling. It's very easy to get off in these tangents. Stay focused on why you're there. Total 100, and when you go for a public uh, uh, round, when you go out to do a, a, a public road show, you get 20 minutes, right? And, and you do like 10 pitches a day. So it's just, you've gotta be like locked in, razor sharp, just like, this is what we're doing, this is how we're gonna make, blah, 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 blah. They hit you with five or six questions, you go, thank you, and you're off. Just, you can, there is no room for, for weak presentations in a good investor pitch. Well, so you don't wanna be that guy. You wanna be her, right? You wanna go, yay, I'm done. Which is, I'm done. <laughs> so. Are there any, any questions? Oh, thank you. Any questions? You want to throw something at me? You know, like, you know, recriminations, anything? Particularly as far as the metric goes, um, do you think the judges would be interested in seeing sort of a hypothetical investment portion of that presentation for a sense that the price point is fixed? Um, we generally ask you to talk about what you're going to do with the money. Um, and um, a lot of people got lost in, well, this is if I get first place, this is if I get second place, this is if I get an in-kind thing. And it's like, no, 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 just tell us what you do if you win. Um, so yes, in that sense, this is an investor pitch. And you're telling us what you're gonna do with the money that we're gonna give you. But you don't need to do like, oh, now then I'm gonna, many times people will say, and I'm gonna use this, and I'm gonna use this to get to a million dollar raise for this much. You can go that far, I don't think it's as essential. Other questions? Is it easier to pitch to investors after you've done an accelerator or an incubator or is that, or is that just sort of uh, delaying? All right, so you're gonna, you're gonna get my, my, my bias here. Every, everybody has their biases. I, I actually, uh, st I, I, I started one of the first accelerators in the country in 2000 and, uh, and I met, I, you know, and they, the word wasn't really in use at that point. Nobody knew what one was. So it was sort of like, well, look, we just don't have office space. That was the easiest way to explain it. I am a firm, uh, look, and accelerators have proliferated as more deals, more entrepreneurs were being created and less money was chasing them. So it's sort of like a holding pen for, for ideas. So the good ones can really prepare you well, right? They can. I don't think it's essential. I think that the, the, uh, honestly, if you, if you follow some of the advice there and, you, and like I wake up every, when I did my best, my business is just one. I knew why my business would win. I was so in love with the customer that no, I, I, I could, I started a business uh, one time. It was one of my entrepreneurial things. I don't count my entrepreneurial things in my exits, but I should. And it was a 30-year-old product that was moribund, and it was sold to uh, newspaper editors. But it was also sold to libraries. And I basically went out and spoke to every newspaper editor in the country, and I found out they weren't using my product. I went out and talked to every librarian I could find, I found out librarians were using it. So we just fell in love with librarians. I talked to every chance I could get in front of librarians, I did it. We changed the title of the thing, we changed the structure of the thing, it was one of the largest growth products for my company. It wound up being the most successful spin out they did. Because I loved that customer. And I can tell you guys, if you just fall in love with a customer and you fall in love with their problem and you understand the economics of that deal backwards and forwards, there's no accelerator that can teach you that. They can tell you how to give the pitch. I just told you how to give the pitch. What they can't do for you is they can't get you into the customer's head. They can't get you to that perfect solution that's just right for the market. So focus on that. 
Accelerators have their benefit. They can give you good networks. They can introduce you to people, but they can't get you that necessarily. Other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you for hanging out with me, and I hope this was helpful for you. Um, I'm a mentor in residence over in the incubator. Um, you can come see me on Tuesdays, 2 to 4, or uh, you can contact me through the website if you have other questions. Thank you. Thank you.